So fun triple header tonight for PBC. It was uh, PBC on Fox and real quick breakdown. Um, the heavyweight opener, I know some of you guys, ignore the GPS over there. I know some of you guys, some of you purists out there would say, ah, oh, this was shit. That was a shit fight between Dominic Brazil and Izu Gono because they were just flailing punches and blah, blah, blah. Look, I like that fight. That was, to me, a heavyweight fight where it was heavyweights doing what heavyweights are supposed to do. They were in there throwing shots. They were in there laying it all on the line, throwing heavy, heavy leather. And there was a lot of back and forth action. For Dominic Brazil, this was his comeback after the beatdown he took to Anthony Joshua last year. And it looked like he learned something in that fight. Uh, he showed a lot of toughness in that fight against Joshua, and he showed toughness in this fight. Igono started fast, and, and he hurt Brazil. Uh, he marked up his face a little bit. He was winning early in the fight, but he was kind of a front runner. He wasn't jabbing. Uh, he wasn't working with fundamentals and setting things up. I think maybe he fell in love with his power. Maybe he got cocky. I don't know. Brazil was a step up in opposition for Igono, and uh, Brazil had more experience boxing experience, Izu Ogono comes from a kickboxing background. And I think some of these guys that come from other sports, particularly other fight sports, other martial arts, they think they could just waltz into boxing. You can't do that. It's, it's a process. And he should have fought smart. But give Dominic Brazil some credit. He came back from behind. He got the stoppage. I thought that was a fun opener. Dominic Brazil is never going to be an elite level heavyweight. He's not going to be a top 10 guy. He's never going to win a world title. But he's going to go as far as that chin and that heart and that toughness will take him. He's not going to beat fighters with his punches. He's uh, very, very slow. And you see every punch coming. But he caught Igono, again, who is lesser experienced. On the inside, he, he caught him with some counter punches, some short, crisp counter punches, and got the stoppage. I thought that was a fun, entertaining heavyweight fight. Okay, the co-main between Jarrett Hurd and Tony Harrison. You guys know my hometown from Detroit, so of course, my heart, I'm going for Tony Harrison, but I, I thought Jarrett Hurd would win this fight by stoppage. That's what I said on the neutral corner, and uh, that's what happened, but look, the first six rounds, I thought Tony Harrison won. I, I There were close competitive rounds, yes, but I thought Tony Harrison was actually making Jared Hurd look amateurish in spots and outclassing him in spots with superior craft, superior skills, athleticism, technique, but there was nothing on it. There was no substance, and Jared Hurd kept pressuring, and he kept putting uh, more and more wear and tear, not necessarily landing big punches, but making Harrison work. And I thought he won the seventh round where he hurt Harrison, and then, of course, in the eighth round, and then he gets the stoppage. Uh, to me, this that fight was a perfect microcosm or example of the difference between a amateur-style boxer and a professional style boxer. Tony Harrison looked great the first three, four, five rounds. And you know, if you follow the amateurs, if you ever fought amateurs, that's what most amateur fights are. They're shorter rounds, shorter number of rounds. And it's not necessarily about hurting your opponent. It's about pity pat shots, landing some punches, spinning off of them, and getting away. And you can win rounds that way. You can win tournaments that way. You could go to the Olympics and win medals that way. That's how the amateurs works. But in the pro ranks, when you're fighting for a, a, a title, and this was for a, a 154-pound title fight, uh, it's 12 rounds. And it's the hurt business. And you, you can't be a front runner. So Hurd kept putting the pressure. And he just had more substance. He had more strength. And later in that fight, that pressure... And that strength got to Harrison, and you saw the difference right there. So Jared Hurd, I'm not going to say he was exposed, but we saw massive flaws in his game. And I think a guy like Demetrius Andre or somebody like that, either of the Charlo brothers, beats Jared Hurd right now. And I don't even think it's a very close fight. I think they beat him decisively right now. Uh, Irislandi Lara, he's getting a little older. He's slowing down. He doesn't have as fast as feet. So maybe, maybe Hurd can be competitive in that fight. But there's a lot that he's got to work on. But because he's got that eraser, because he has that power, because he keeps coming forward, he has that strength, uh, and he, his shots, he has heavy hands. He's going to go far in the pro ranks. He's just got to tighten some things up. Because a guy with craft and movement, like some of the fighters I just talked about, uh, fight 
guys who use movement to fight but also have a little more substance, sit down on their punches more, have a better chin than Tony Harrison, they're going to give Jared Hurd a bunch of problems. As it stands now, he has a world title, but let's not get it twisted. Jared Hurd is another prospect, a good-looking blue-chip prospect, but he's another prospect with a world title. Not unlike somebody like Anthony Joshua in the heavyweight division or several other fighters right now. That's the state of boxing we're in, where some of these guys who don't even have 20 pro fights yet are winning world titles. That's just the way it works right now. Okay, main event time. Good heavyweight fight. Gerald Washington did very good in the early rounds. Uh, the first round you could maybe say was even. I thought Washington clearly won the second round. I thought the third round was a better round for Wilder. I could see where you could maybe give him that round. Uh, I thought the fourth round Gerald Washington won. My personal scorecard going into the fifth round, I had Gerald Washington up three rounds to one. That was my scorecard. All that really didn't mean much because Washington wasn't hurting Wilder. He was giving him something to think about because of his size. And you remember in the neutral corner this week, I talked about it. This is the first time for Deontay Wilder that he was fighting a guy with uh, this, this amount of strength, size, length, athleticism, youth, undefeated record, all of it. And a guy who knows contact because Gerald Washington comes from a football background. Uh, so it was a, a unique combination for Wilder. And he was coming off a layoff. He was coming off an injury. He was coming off uh, the, the court battle with um, Alexander Povetkin and all these distractions. So it didn't surprise me that the first three, four rounds he started slowly. But that first right hand that he landed, Gerald Washington was keeping distance early on, but in the fifth round, he got a little bit lazy. He got caught at mid-range distance and Wilder landed a counter right hand uh, right to the side of the head. And then he followed up with a nice left hook that was it. That was it right there. Washington was, went down. Uh, I thought the ref maybe stopped a little premature. I thought the ref... I, this is why I think we need to bring back the standing eight count. Gerald Washington was done. His legs were done, but he was trying to stay up on his feet. And give the guy a standing eight count, whatever. Let the fight go a few more seconds. Let him take a couple more shots. And let it be a little more decisive. Either way, might have been... a ounce premature, but the fight was over. Washington was was messed up. He had bad legs. We've seen crazier things happen. We've seen guys like that throw a haymaker punch out of nowhere and come back to win a fight when it seemed like all was lost. That only happens 1% of the time. The other 99% of the time, what we all think is going to happen happens. And that's probably what was going to happen here. Deontay Wilder was eventually going to chop him down and score a concussive, huge knockout. The fight was over. So, good one for Wilder. He's got to step up the opposition now. He's really, really got to step it up. And let's be clear about this. Wilder hasn't fought the best opposition, and for a long time, that was on him. That was on his handlers. But what happened to him last year and early this year, including this fight, that wasn't on him. That's not his fault. All that's behind him now, all that stuff, right? Let's move forward. Let's see if he takes a tough opponent going forward. Uh, right now, the heavyweight division is wide open, and a lot of people like to bash the heavyweight division. I don't get it. There's interesting fights to be made. Are any of these guys the second coming of uh, Muhammad Ali, the second coming of Joe Lewis or Rocky Marciano? Are any of them the second coming of Vladimir Klitschko? I don't know. Probably not. But they're athletic. They're coming into the ring in shape. They look the part. They're taking it serious. These guys are training hard. We had a fight tonight between two undefeated American heavyweights who weren't fat, who weren't bloated, who didn't have criminal records, who didn't come into the ring uh, you know, with legal issues or any of that stuff. They were both in great shape. And they both treated each other with respect in class. And they put on an entertaining fight. When is the last time you could say that if you're an American boxing fan? So stop bitching. The heavyweight division's good right now. Enjoy it. One last thing. Gerald Washington making the leap from football to boxing. I talked a little bit about this as well on the neutral corner this week. Football players, for the most part, don't move their upper body. They're stiff. They're slower. 
I understand in football terms, they're fast. You guys like wide receivers and stuff like that. I'm talking about defensive players, linemen, guys like that. It's more about the lower body. It's about getting low, getting leverage to make tackles, that kind of stuff, right? That doesn't correlate well to boxing. We haven't seen a football player yet make that transition. And yes, they're used to taking contact, but not like in boxing. Getting tackled, even taking a bone-crunching tackle that breaks your ribs or you separate a shoulder because you get plowed into the ground or something, it's just not the same as taking a shot on the chin with no helmet from a guy who knows what he's doing. It's very, very hard to make that transition. And you can see in the ring, even though Washington was having moments against Wilder, right, he was so stiff with his upper body and moving like a football player. And football players play eight seconds at a time, 10 seconds at a time. They have 45 seconds between plays. They have timeouts. They have teammates. They have all this stuff. Boxing is continuous for three minutes. You cannot stop. You cannot get lazy for one second. Gerald Washington was doing well in that fight and winning that fight, and then he got caught in one moment at mid-range distance and ate a right hand, and that was it. So I just think we're going to see more of these football players, at least in America, try to make that transition, and I still think they're going to continue to struggle with that transition. I do think that a basketball player who can handle the contact, and let's be honest, basketball is a pussy fucking sport. It's a pussy sport. I'll just say it right now. But the the movement of basketball, the fluidity, uh, the agility, the constant motion, offense, defense, you play everything in basketball. It's not a skill position, the uh, sport. That correlates, translates better to boxing. So if you have a basketball player who can handle the contact and so far, Deontay Wilder has shown he can. I think that translates and correlates better to boxing. We might see some more American heavyweights come from that world and have more success than football players. Even though football players are used to contact, it's a much different kind of contact than you get in boxing. So that's it. I think that this was a fun PBC card. Next week, we have Thurman Garcia, which is probably the best event on paper, the best matchup in the history of PBC. Look, man, they're doing a good job so far in 2017. I give uh, credit where credit is due, and I enjoyed tonight's doubleheader. None of these guys who fought tonight are going in the Hall of Fame, but 99% of pro boxers out there right now are not going in the Hall of Fame. It still doesn't mean you can't enjoy the fights, and I enjoyed these fights tonight. Good stuff from PBC.